Welcome everyone. Today I'll be walking through some tips and tricks to help you get more out of your playtime in Hard Space Shipbreaker. I'll be discussing some general tips to start, followed by a few tips regarding uses for your equipment, and then a few more about some practical gameplay elements to help make your game a bit smoother. Finally, there will be a general tip to maximize your enjoyment of the game. Feel free to jump around with the timestamps in the description. If you find any of these tips especially helpful, or you have another tip or trick that you think I missed, please share in the comments. Kicking things off with the general tips. These tips aren't all that earth-shattering, but can really help to streamline the salvaging process. If you're looking to do several shifts back to back, you'll definitely want to keep these things in mind. First up, have a plan. When starting a shift, whether with a new ship or one that's already halfway disassembled, it's always a good idea to know what you're trying to accomplish with that shift. The ships are all pretty big, and some of them are quite complicated. When you are cutting a ship apart, it can be pretty easy to get distracted by something next to whatever you're working on. Sometimes your plan will actually change, but you should always keep in mind the original goal, or your 15 minutes will be up before you've done what you wanted to finish. Yes, you can always do another shift, but a good plan can help you break a ship down quicker. This also comes into play when picking a ship at the start of a shift. Pay attention to how much value is left in the salvage yard. Is it worth it to incur another day's worth of fees to finish a ship? Are you close to another bonus level where the LP you earn might make up for the day's losses? There is no penalty in the game for starting a new ship, so feel free to start something new if you mess up a ship, or even just because you feel like it. Next, take your time. The 15 minute timer can make it seem like you need to rush to salvage as much as possible as quickly as possible. Don't. Rushing through a cut might damage something valuable, blow something into a mess of tiny pieces, or even explosively decompress the ship and send it flying off. The only downside of finishing a shift is the extra debt from all the shift fees that Lynx charges you. But if you combine this with previous tips, you'll easily be profitable even on slow days. The only thing in the game that is really time sensitive is when you're extracting a reactor for salvage. Managing that is just a matter of being aware of what triggers the reactor to start melting down. For level 1 reactors, don't pull them out until you have a clear path to the barge. For level 2 reactors, make sure you have a clear path to the barge and the reactor case panels are removed so you have enough space to extract the actual reactor before pulling out the coolant. Extracting the coolant before the reactor will give you a bit more time before the reactor goes critical, but you should have plenty of time in either case. To round out the general tips, use and refill your resources. The resources in this game are a bit of a sore point for me. I hated going back to refill my oxygen every shift but it was more the interruption of going to get it than the actual monetary cost. The usefulness of the resources greatly outweighs the cost in all cases. Some, like oxygen and fuel, you need to be able to actually salvage the ships. Others, like tethers and mines, make your job a lot easier. In any case, the cost of the resource is well worth the benefits you'll get, and you'll quickly recoup the costs. There are a few extra things to note here. First, you start each shift with a full tank of oxygen, but you won't be able to make it through a full shift until you get quite a few upgrades. More on those later. In the meantime, you don't gain anything extra from waiting until you are almost out of oxygen to refill it. So if you find yourself closer to the kiosk and your shift is at least half over, go ahead and top it off so you don't have to travel as far later. Additionally, You'll sometimes find free fuel and oxygen while salvaging the ship. Use it. Yes, the game yells at you saying that you're a bad employee, but that's all that happens. There's no other downside, so you might as well make use of the things that you find. That wraps up the general tips section, so now we'll move on to some tips and tricks regarding your equipment to help you get the most out of it. One of the two primary pieces of equipment you'll be using is the grapple. Normally, this is what you use to move pieces of the ship, but it does have another use. 
Normally, you use your suit's thrusters to move around, but physics is fun. You can attach your grapple to any of the walls or anchors in the shipyard, or even the ship itself if enough of it is left, and then try to reel it in. The result will accelerate you at great speed toward whatever you are grappling. Now, this method of travel is a bit tricky to control, so you probably won't want to use it all the time, but it's great in a pinch, if you happen to find yourself falling or being pulled into a furnace, for example, or if you run out of fuel in your, sh in your suit. Also, with some practice, it can make a great way to get back and forth between the habitat and the ship when you need to hit up the kiosk for supplies. Aside from grapple traveling, the grapple has one more feature that you need to take advantage of. Tethers are your friend. The game tells you this. Moving large pieces of the ship around can take a lot of time with just the grapple. Fortunately, you can use the grapple to attach tethers to things that will pull the two things together. Now, you might think that you should try to avoid them because they cost money at the kiosk. This is the tip. Putting your grapples to work allows you more time to break up other parts of the ship. Tether chunks of the hull to the furnace or processor and let them do the work of getting it the last little bit. Sometimes you may even need multiple tethers on the same object to help get it where it needs to go. This is also fine and encouraged. The cost of tethers is insignificant next to the help they give you in moving all your junk around. Now for upgrades. This section is going to be a little bit longer and a bit more subjective, but I hope I can provide you with some insight into the value of some of the various upgrades that are available to you. To start, you can purchase upgrades with LP, which you earn for salvaging various amounts of ships. You also increase your rank by doing this, which allows you to purchase higher level upgrades. You tend to earn more LP and rank points for each of the levels you complete on a given ship. If you find yourself wanting upgrades, which you will, you'll want to try to reach all of the levels your current ship has to offer before moving on to the next ship. As for the upgrades themselves, they are broken down by the piece of equipment that they upgrade. In general, I always put a priority on durability drain, but as I mentioned in tip 3, the cost of repairing equipment is pretty low, I just like not having to worry about it as often. I also tended to prioritize purchasing my own equipment because that puts a huge dent into the daily costs to links, but you won't be able to unlock any of those until pretty late in the game, since the rank requirements are pretty high. For specific equipment, let's start at the top of the list and work our way down. So starting with the laser cutter, I never found much use for the range on the laser cutter, as I found cutting things farther away makes it more likely for me to hit something on accident. Similarly, the faster cooldown didn't seem to do much for me, as the base cooldown was pretty quick already. I did, however, find a lot of use for the heat capacity upgrades. The more heat your cutter can take, the more you can cut through at a given time. Some cut points will require this upgrade for you to be able to cut through it with the cutter in the first place, so it was nearly always near the top of my list. Continuing down the list is the grapple. As with the cutter, I didn't find much use for the range upgrade, but the strength upgrade was very useful. It lets you apply more force so you can move larger objects, getting you more profit out of your grapple. For tether upgrades, I never had a problem with their lifetime. They tended to do the job I wanted of them often enough in the base lifetime, but there was always a use for more tethers. The final upgrade available for the grapple is the force push. It basically blasts whatever is in front of you towards whatever you're looking at. Upgrading this and charging it lets you push objects with a great deal of force. A lot of times this can let you conserve tethers, so picking this up is useful, but will depend a bit on your playstyle. The thrusters have three options available for upgrades. Top speed and braking are no-brainers. Get them when you can. Fuel capacity, on the other hand, seems like a waste of points to me. Your base fuel capacity lasts through many shifts, and fuel is cheap to pick up at the start of a shift if you happen to be running low. Only pick this up if you really want to buy everything. 
The different mode upgrades for the scanner are a must. You'll be looking for different things at different times, and the ability to highlight what you're looking for makes your job so much easier. The range here is also useful, but only up to a point. The farther away things get, the harder it is to actually make them out on the scanner, as things can get a little bit cluttered. So pick up a few upgrades, but stop when you don't feel you can actually make the things out at the new range. The helmet is where you find your oxygen capacity upgrades. The first three upgrades will have you refilling your oxygen once a shift, but the fourth level is what you really want. Oxygen capacity 4 will let you make it through a full shift without needing an oxygen refill. Pick this up as soon as you hit rank 13. Level 5, however, is a waste, so stop at level 4. As for oxygen recharge, I rarely found myself working in a pressurized section of a ship, so I just took a hard pass on it. I didn't find it useful. The suit upgrades in general I found largely useless. Maybe I just played more carefully than most, but I found all the hazards in the ships easy enough to find and avoid. If you never stumble into any of the hazards, upgrading your suit's resistance to them doesn't get you very much. If you find yourself having problems with something specific, by all means, upgrade for it to help you out. Otherwise, just spend your points elsewhere. Last on the list is demolition charge. I never wanted to pick up a deployed charge and certainly never considered throwing one, so those upgrades were both out for me. Capacity is a nice convenience upgrade, but the self-cleanup is the real gem in this set. I very often found that detonating a charge would damage things around whatever I wanted to cut or destroy. This made the size of the explosion very relevant, and making it smaller allowed the charges to be more useful in more scenarios with far less collateral damage. Alright, upgrades was long, but now we're going to move on to a few tips that I found helpful throughout the shifts. But if you're finding these tips useful, please like and subscribe for more content like this. Now, on to actual ship demolition. The first thing I always start with on any new ship is depressurizing it. Cutting the wrong part of a ship while it's still pressurized can have some explosive outcomes. Generally, you want to use the airlocks and atmospheric control units to safely decompress a ship. Work your way around until all the interior sections are basically connected as one big room. Then you can just use the control unit to depressurize everything and open the airlock. Simple and safe. Every now and then though, you'll run into either a damaged control unit or a configuration that just won't merge together nicely. In this case, I try where, whenever possible to do the final decompression with a door. The game tells you there is danger in this, which is true, but it's fairly minimal. Maneuver yourself close to a wall, open the door, and hang on to the wall until things settle. Yes, you can absolutely hang on to things in this game. Your gloves will allow you to hold on to just about anything. In the rare case where you find you have to cut the ship open to finish the depressurization, try to keep the wall section small and hold on to the larger section until the depressurization finishes. Physics will send the smaller piece somewhere, but the larger section won't move much, usually. The aim of this next tip is to help people with one of the mechanics that I personally struggled with. I'm not sure if the game did a bad job of explaining this, or if I just wasn't paying enough attention when it did, but this is the one mechanic that I needed to look up how to do, so I'm capturing it here for you. Before you can pull out the main power generator for a ship, this is different from the reactor. There are two or three fuses that you need to find and remove. In order to remove each fuse, you'll have to time it right so that the red lights are all off when you eject it. The lights start blinking faster for each fuse that is removed, so you'll need to take your time and make sure the light is off or you'll get yourself a bit of a shock. You'll also lose the value of the fuse. Do it right and the juicy salvage fee for the power generator is just a quick trip to the barge away. Moving on, we're going to talk about one of the hazards in the game that I found particularly annoying, AI nodes. These are small items that are scattered all around certain ships. It's pretty easy to identify which ships have them when selecting the ship you're going to work on because the ship information will appear scrambled. 
there isn't really any special benefit to choosing these ships other than one or two achievements, though the AI nodes themselves are pretty easy to remove and do pay out reasonably well. They can cause quite a bit of havoc with the rest of your salvage though. They will randomly open and close doors and airlocks, and randomly pressurize or depressurize areas of the ship. Since a lot of the nodes can be tricky to hunt down or get to, the easiest way to neutralize the pressurization ability is simply to crack open the hull of the ship. They can't pressurize the interior of a ship that is open to space. If you'd rather hunt them down first before progressing, that's fine too. Your object scanner will even highlight all of the AI nodes in red to make them easier to see. They do mess with the scanner a little bit though, so you'll need to be somewhat close to them. They can also spawn in hard to reach places sometimes, so you may have to work a bit at getting to them. Alright everybody, we've made it to the last tip. This one is just general good advice. Enjoy playing the game. Have fun. If there is something about the game you don't like doing, try to avoid it. Do you hate dealing with AI nodes? I do, and I rarely selected those ships to work on. Do you find depressurizing ships annoying? Blow the thing open so you don't have to worry about it. Watching things fly around can be fun and satisfying too. The game doesn't really punish you for anything significantly, so do whatever you want. Fly around with tethers and smack into anchors. Dive into the furnace for fun. No profit though. First and foremost, this is a game. No game is going to be fun for everyone. If this game is not fun for you, try playing something else. Are there, there are too many games out there to spend time on ones that you don't find enjoyable. I hope you found at least some of these tips useful. If you did, let me know in the comments. Did I miss some tips or tricks? Let me know that too. If there is another game you'd like to see me review and or give tips for, I'd love to hear about it. If you just want to see what I'm playing next, come hang out with me over on Twitch. Until next time everyone, keep having fun.